Thank you, the Icon School of Medicine, for inviting us to be here. We are so honored to be your keynote speakers, and we're so appreciative of our friends at the Cohen Foundation for their generous sponsorship of this event. I opened my practice in Connecticut, in the heart of Lyme disease country, in 1996. And when I look back on my career, I can't help think of the chance of events that led me to this point. Growing up in New York City suburbs, I knew so many people with Lyme disease, and even back then, they're expressing a common theme, frustration with lack of easy diagnosis, frustration with chronic symptoms after a short course of antibiotics. And so even though I graduated from University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and landed this dream job on Wall Street, when I went to med school on a day after a friend, in the back of my mind, I couldn't stop thinking about Lyme disease and the mysteries that held on. Little did I know that Lyme was just the piece of a bigger puzzle. During my residency at Yale, my research was focused on microbiology and immunology. And but what truly galvanized me and put me on this mission to solve this riddle was the slow but disturbing realization that my father had been suffering from undiagnosed Lyme for nearly two decades with um, near fatal consequences. He had what doctors labeled a viral meningitis in the 1970s, and shortly after that, developed atrial fibrillation a type of heart arrhythmia. And then over time, he got progressive heart failure, and we took him everywhere. We took him to the heads of all the major cardiology uh, teaching hospitals, and they couldn't help him. They couldn't stop his decline. They gave him their best medicines, and nothing worked. And not one of them ever mentioned Lyme. His official diagnosis was idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, which translates to heart muscle damage of unknown etiology. And they wanted to give him a heart transplant. In fact, it was the only option that they offered. And without it, they'd estimated that he'd have six months to live. So it turns out the Lyme can cause dilated cardiomyopathy. And I asked his doctor if we can evaluate him for this. But he didn't have any of the stereotypical features. He didn't have a rash or arthritis or Bell's palsy. And they refused. They refused to even test him. I asked if they could prescribe some doxycycline just as a trial to see if it would help. They refused that as well. So it was up to me. I didn't want my dad going through an unnecessary heart transplant. And I ended up diagnosing and treating him for Lyme. And he fully normalized the situation. His heart function at almost 90 years old now is fully normal. And I remember thinking back on those doctors' responses and how idiotic it was in retrospect, since I myself took three years of doxycycline for acne as a teenager and nobody better than I. So after this experience, I opened my practice, and I had a focus on complex presentations of Lyme and other vector-borne infections. And I quickly noticed something. These patients were coming into me, and they had these diagnoses of one or more chronic illnesses, chronic illnesses of unknown etiology, things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, stuff like inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, and chronic neurologic illnesses like MS and neuropathy. And many of them develop psychiatric symptoms as well. So I figured out then that if I could just home in on their underlying infections and treat them, maybe I can affect their chronic illness. Exactly what I did. And as I started treating these patients for their underlying infections, I was watching in amazement as their chronic illnesses melted away. And I learned back then that nature's not fickle, that Lyme and other infections such as Bartonella and many others are quite likely at the heart of a range of chronic disease states. And getting to the root of these problems is an immeasurably better strategy than palliation of symptoms, which is the common medical dogma. So this is what motivated me, along with my co-author, Dana Parrish, to write our book, Chronic, The Hidden Cause of the Autoimmune Pandemic and How to Get Healthy Again. It's set for a wide release in February 2021 and has been embraced by mainstream academia. And so now I'll introduce Dana Parrish, my friend and co author. Hi, I'm Dana Parrish, and I'm honored to be here with you today. And I want to thank the Cohen Foundation and the Icon School of Medicine for having us. I'm the co author of the book coming out called Chronic The Hidden Cause of the Autoimmune Pandemic and How to Get Healthy Again. My life and music career were totally derailed after a tick bite in the summer of 2014. I was in the lucky minority who saw the bite and the bullseye and was able to get treatment within five days. I was told that this would be curative. I got three weeks of doxycycline and was told, don't worry about it. Go on with your life. 
But within just two months of finishing my course of doxycycline, my entire body was haywire. I saw a, to a dozen top New York City doctors who unanimously said I could not possibly still have Lyme, no matter how many times I asked, uh, including three infectious disease doctors. I was not offered any education or any further testing for other diseases. Although I was perfectly healthy before the bite, and I pointed this out numerous times, not a single doctor would entertain the fact that I may have an ongoing active Lyme or some other kind of infection transmitted by that tick bite. Uh, nobody agreed that my symptoms had anything to do with it, and yet they had no other explanation. By Christmas, five months later, I was in heart failure and I was really having trouble breathing. I was so lucky to finally be referred to Dr. Phillips at that time. Not only did he discover that I still had Lyme, but he found that I had another infection called Bartonella, also very commonly um, misunderstood and can be chronic and very stealth, very hard to find. Under Dr. Phillips' care, I got better over the course of a year with pulsed rotating antibiotics and antimicrobials um, and some Chinese herbs. Uh, my heart failure resolved within two months. What I learned in my quest for wellness was shocking. I had no idea that tick-borne disease was even controversial. I know it's kind of hilarious to think about that now. I had no clue that it was rampant around the globe. I had no idea that it caused so much chronic and autoimmune disease. I didn't know it could be at the root of MS and fibromyalgia and RA and even Alzheimer's and psychiatric diseases. None of the doctors that I saw seem to know either. Um, Dr. Phillips always tells me, well, he got 15 minutes of education online in medical school and it was all wrong. And I totally believe him. Finding out the truth about this medical travesty and seeing how many lives it decimated, I knew I had to do something about it. I took a break from my music career after I got well and I went public with my story. I did every piece of press that I could. I wrote a column about Lyme for the Huffington Post and was so honored that it was read by so many people. Hearing from so many people around the world motivated me even more. And ultimately it's what helped me to write this book with Dr. Phillips and really get a good, good solid understanding of the picture. We're now in the midst of two pandemics, Lyme and COVID, with profound medical and political overlap and ramifications. If anything good can come out of COVID, it'll be that finally the world is seeing what Lyme patients have been screaming about for decades. All of our mainstream health officials are so confusing and are so misleading at times, and none of us know what to think. We have poor testing in both diseases, very, very unreliable. We've been told that most recover from COVID, but it turns out that huge numbers have lingering symptoms, so much like chronic Lyme patients. And they're told that they have some post-viral syndrome, just like we're told that we have some post-Lyme disease, uh, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And both of those terms imply that the discovery is over. We're not going to keep looking for the root cause of, of disease. And maybe in both cases, there's an infection at play. Everything should still be on the table. So in that same in that same vein, there's been a lot of other confusing and mixed messages. Should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? Is it airborne? Is it not airborne? Well, you know, now we know so many more things as time went on, but you know, the most important message I can give to patients as I end this talk is to say, do your diligence, do your own work in discovery and look at both sides. You may find the truth that you didn't know existed. Uh, I always believed everything I read. I always believed doctors uh, my whole life until this experience really woke me up to the fact that I needed to really be my own advocate and try to make my own opinion and try to get myself better as best I could. So thank you so much for having us today. Hi, Dana, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the overlaps between COVID and Lyme are almost uncanny. You know, the poor testing, the problems with chronicity, the problems with mixed messages, when, initially, when I heard them say that, you know, masks don't help when there are literally decades of evidence supporting masks being beneficial for prevention of airborne viruses and say, okay, the masks don't help you, general public, but we desperately need them for medical practitioners. It was such a mixed message and so easy to say, what? That doesn't make any sense. 
And it's kind of a similar thing we'll be hearing with Lyme. You say, oh, there's no such thing as chronic Lyme, but oops, we found the bacteria alive from patients who've done literally years of antibiotics, but we're not going to call it chronic Lyme, we're going to call it post Lyme. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's an obvious, uh, that's an ob obvious similarity. But um, the, 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 the greater truth, I think, is the relationship of infection to chronic illness in general. Don't you find? Yes, I do. And I'm so worried that all these long haulers, as they call themselves in COVID, are going to be relegated to a post-viral syndrome, um, which was so you know clear to me from the beginning, I'm hearing that language all, all across the mainstream media and all these doctors are commenting that it's a post-viral syndrome. And I want to cry because I really think that uh, ongoing infection needs to be considered because there's so much precedent. Well, post-infection syndromes are an inherently unsatisfying term because the investigation stops as soon as anybody mentions the term. Uh, right. Just puts people in a box and, and then that's it. They get no further research dollars. They just say, what was me? You have this post, you know, post whatever syndrome. We're not going to investigate you anymore. Right. Uh, right. So and it's kind of a similar situation, I think, with chronic and inflammatory illness because I can't count how many times patients have come to see me with diagnoses of MS. And if you look back at the MS literature, they were finding a spiroidal infection in the brains and spinal fluids from MS patients going back nearly 100 years. And uh, they've done studies where they've inoculated you know, uh, spinal fluid and brain tissue from MS patients into animals and showed the animals develop neurologic illness, and in some cases, spirochetes were then isolated from the animals. And everything pointed toward a spirochetal infection as the cause of MS, and this is what the thought leaders, where they were going in, those, in, in that wisdom that's somehow been lost. And then with the advent of steroids and the quick fix and suppression of the uh, inflammation uh, allowed these patients, so sprung the theory of autoimmune illness. And I think that that was a dangerous path and um, medicine has gone down that path and stopped looking for causes of chronic and inflammatory illness and instead just focused on palliation. If I had to count how many commercials or immune suppressive drugs, if you watch a commercial for medicines, every other commercial is basically an immune suppressive drug. Right. And we write a lot about this in our book. We talk so much about this because it's one of the biggest controversies in medicine. Um, also, we should talk a little bit about all the psychiatric symptoms that come on after an infection. I mean, it happened to me, and I watched it in real time. So right after my bite, one of the first things that happened was that I got a severe case of insomnia, and I never had any trouble sleeping before. I got severe paralyzing anxiety and depression and even OCD. Um, and you remember I was having those strange hallucinations before bed that are so common, and I was incredibly shocked. Uh, by them. And I knew something was really wrong with my brain. Um, and when I came to see you, I was so reassured that, you know, you could help me get better from that with that treatment instead of putting me on a bunch of psychiatric drugs, which was my biggest fear. Um, and and I, I, got, you know, it, I got better. Yeah. It, it, listen, if people develop psychiatric illness to the point that they're in danger of harming themselves or others or they're truly suffering, I'm not anti- and then I'm not anti-psych medicine. You know, I don't want my patients to suffer, but at the same time, we have to be looking at to the cause of the original illness. Just to just to palliate, it's just a sucker's game. You know, you can keep right. people on palliative medicines the rest of their lives. If you never find the cause of their illness, you never. There's no chance. There's no hope of cure. So um, have you had people come to you with profound psychiatric illness that were on psychiatric drugs and then treated an underlying infection and got off of the drugs? Too many times to count, literally too many times. You know, I've treated over 20,000 patients. I would say about half my patients have significant psychiatric overlay. Then you say, well, is that because they're chronically ill and they develop, you know, reactive depression or reactive anxiety? You know, partially, it's hard to go through a life changing illness and not develop some degree of PTSD and anxiety and, and reactive depression from the illness itself. But then I have some patients that have really minimal physical symptoms, they still develop serious psychiatric illness. And I've had some patients develop just a purely psychiatric picture. And in those patients, you couldn't possibly argue that it's reactive to their illness because they don't really feel sick. They yeah. just, the blue, uh, seem to have, um, you know, the development of a serious psychiatric syndrome. And yeah. 
you know, that's been, you know, relatively rare, but I've seen it. I've seen it enough times that it really, really drives the point home. I also think it's important to talk about infl inflammatory arthritis syndromes, yeah. uh, you know, psoriatic and rheumatoid arthritis. People don't realize that both Lyme and Bartonella have been implicated in inflammatory arthritis. And there are in excess of 12 randomized controlled trials, which mm -hmm. means that they're, you know, they're blindly giving drug versus placebo mm -hmm. patients with inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis and show that antibiotics do help for inflammatory arthritis, whereas placebo does not. And they've also shown that antibiotics help for inflammatory arthritis, even when kind of more, let's say, commonly used therapies like immunosuppressives like methotrexate or steroids are not working well, the antibiotics work better. Mm -hmm. And they've used antibiotics that do not have anti-inflammatory activity because that's the big critique that some rheumatologists have. They say, of course, the patients get better with antibiotic therapy. The antibiotics are an anti-inflammatory. Some of them are, and some of them are not. And the patients respond to the ones that are not as well. So mm -hmm. it, it's, not, it's not suitable just to say it's an anti-inflammatory effect. And uh, certainly, even the antibiotics that have an anti-inflammatory effect, it's pretty small compared to things like methotrexate and steroids, which basically shut down the immune system. Well, you lead me to thinking about Harvoni and the fact that there's no money in cures, but lots and lots of money in chronic debilitating illness. So yeah. it's a really sad, it almost makes us sound jaded, but <laughs> how can you not be jaded from doing this for, I've been at this for 25 years and yeah. it's really plainly visible now to me that, that there's no money in cures and they've actually done, there's medical articles published on, on this very same thing. You know, the, the editors of the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet have been quoted as uh, saying that, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but saying that the pharmaceutical industries have basically taken over many aspects of medicine and that many of the articles that are published are just simply untrue. And, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, uh, you know, just basically needs some reform in this, in this area. That this should be a, a more independent, objective, like a reclaiming of objective science, and it's yeah. not as objective as it used to be. And COVID is another example of that. You know, it's all playing out in front of us, retracted studies, confusing stuff that's not so sciencey. And look over here, look over here, and it's what are you know, people, patients don't know what to think, and it, it's difficult to uh, find people like you to be able to synthesize all this information appropriately and say, okay, here's what I think you should do next to get that really really hard to find these doctors really hard I think how many people how many doctors do people see on the average before they get to you 10 or 15 usually yeah it's a lot 10 or 15 yeah. i think location okay. hydroxychloroquine is a perfect example of, yeah. of you know the lack of objectivity in science and that's played out in the stage that everyone everyone has heard of what poison hydroxychloroquine is Meanwhile, it's been prescribed around the world for 65 years, and I don't know how many hundreds of millions of doses have been taken safely, and it's it's, uh, it's got an exceptional safety record, and pregnant ladies have taken it, and old people and young people, people have taken it for years, and all of a sudden it's poison. Right, right. That that should give one great pause just by watching that, that drama play out. I used to really believe everything I read. And I used to believe everything doctors told me pretty much at face value. And this experience really uh, makes you become a much more critical thinker. And it makes you consider all evidence. And as a non-scientist, I've learned to read so many studies. And yes, I'll call you with questions sometimes or many times. But, you know, I've learned to make my own opinions based upon what feels like common sense, my intuition, and the evidence that's out there. And a lot of times what you're presented is only one very biased side of the story. Um, that was my personal experience that I had a post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Nobody really knew what to do with me. I was on a path to steroids and all kinds of other stuff that probably wouldn't have been too helpful in the long run. So, you know, I, I I'm living. <laughs> down to a lot of, a lot of common sense. I think that, um, you know, doctors are trained with, you know, I know I was and and I do believe it's universal that doctors are trained in, in, in how to interpret studies correctly and, and correct study design. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many doctors don't have the basic understanding of, of what a good study means, or, uh, how, to, how to critique a study and how to, you know, 
realize that sometimes just reading the conclusion or the headline isn't enough and you have to dig deeper. Um, so I do want us to just talk about the book a little bit because our good friend, you know, Neil Spector wrote the forward and yes. he was an amazing human being and an amazing physician and scientist and friend. all around, you know, friend and angel. And he wrote our forward and now it has a double meaning from such a emotional standpoint, as well as his beautiful words. And yeah. um, we should also comment how we've been just so overwhelmed by how how well the book has been received by academic physicians, if you wanted to name a, a, a couple. Um, well, I mean, it was really amazing to get Sanjay Gupta, the chief medical correspondent of CNN, to get his endorsement on the front. And, you know, everybody that endorsed this book read it first. Um, you have to. We got George Church from Harvard, who's the father of the human genome, and um, lots of really exciting, you know, I mean, for us, this is this is just an incredible honor to have these amazing scientists. Um, Basically, said no. You know, we sent the book out, and everybody was like, absolutely. It wasn't, it, you know, Lyme can be a controversial topic. Bartonella, no one ever heard of Bartonella. You know, it's not right. really controversial. It's just, just right. like the the third child that's somehow ignored, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but we explore many of them. We explore so many, uh, so many rabbit holes in this book. And what did George Church said? I think he said something, it's like, it's like something to the band played on. Like, yeah, I'm looking at, he said, this trailblazing book should serve to galvanize efforts to solve the autoimmune crisis in the same way the band played on did for HIV. Wow, it's amazing, know. you know? I know, and, and most important, um, it was your idea to reveal the dedication in the book. Uh, would you like me to do that since I have it? Right. Um, so, the dedication is beautiful. Okay. Well, this is really for the patients um, that we wrote this book at the end of the day. And um, we said to the broken ones, may this book empower you to feel whole again. And we really genuinely mean that. So we hope that this helps you in some way. Well said. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to our live questions and answers period with Dr. Phillips and Dana Parrish. Uh, so excited to have you guys with us today. It's been so many years since I first met you, and um, it's just it's thrilling to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it's been an amazing ride we've had together. Yeah, that's right. Um, so when we first met, you were telling me about the journey to to start writing this book. And uh, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about this process. A patient and a doctor coming together to to tell this story is, is to me, very special and uh, just very curious as to how this journey started and where you're at with it today. I think it was, uh, Dana, it was a mutual friend's idea, really. And... Right. It sounded crazy at first, and we just put some feelers out to see if there was interest, and we were overwhelmed by the response because it's such a, a huge topic, and uh, and then it just began a snowball, and we just kept rolling down the hill with it, and you know it's been hanging on for dear life basically. The process has been great though; it's been a learning process. I figured, you know, we're going to write this book, we're going to teach so many people so many things. You end up learning so much more than you you think. You know, it's a learning; it's just one big learning experience. We interviewed over 100 people for the book, and it's taken years. It's been a great effort. It has. It, it started with uh, my friend had a dream, and she woke up really early in the morning, and she said. Dana and Steve are going to write a book together and called me and I, I told him and he was like, this is crazy. I'm like, I know it's crazy. And the next thing we know, we have a book. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. So amazing. That's wonderful. So um, to everybody out there who's been sending in questions, thank you. Um, I'm, I think our first question came in from Linda. It's for Dr. Phillips. And she asks, Dr. Phillips, why do you think your medical colleagues are so resistant to the idea that chronic infection can be causal for so many symptoms? I think there's a tendency. It's kind of a paradigm. And, you know, you kind of absorb from your environment. You don't think we're going to kind of, you know, let those toxic effects of a, a messed up culture kind of seep into us. But the paradigm of medicine is to kind of palliate. 
And there's so many diseases that historically have had no known cause that are chronic conditions. So doctors don't want to feel like they're helpless to treat the patients. So they end up giving them medicines to make them feel better. But it's not always in the best long-term interest of the patient. Really, I think the best thing to do is treat the cause and obviously treat the symptoms so the patient doesn't suffer. But, you know, the thinking is that the symptoms will kind of take care of themselves over time if you get the cause to be minimized or actually gone. Um, I think a nice follow on to that question, and this is probably a good question for you both, is from Mary, who asks um, if you have any advice for finding a doctor who can help um, who can help have a more holistic methodology and belief system. I'm, I mean, I can speak from personal experience um, about this uh, pretty deeply. Um, I saw 12, 11, 12 doctors that totally dismissed what was very clearly in retrospect. Lyme, um, Lyme and Bartonella. So I would say that um, I would start, if you have some of the symptoms that we talk about um, in this conference today, I would go to an ILADS doctor and go to somebody who's really a trained specialist in this field. Um, and I wouldn't stop until you find a doctor that feels right to you and a diagnosis that makes sense and where you see the light. I mean, I couldn't see any light. Um, for a long time until I found the right care. I just tell people also it's a numbers game. You know, it's, you, you, it's easy to become disillusioned when you have a couple of really bad appointments and just think that, you know, Dr. Prince Charming is around the corner. You know, there, there can be a good fit for most people and not to give up after a few bad experiences because you got to kiss a lot of frogs sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. I wish that didn't have to be the case with our healthcare system, though, right? I, I wish. It's, uh, <laughs> and hopefully things will change. But Yes. Um, Su Susan asks if there are any treatments or thoughts on what helps most um, to heal someone with psychiatric symptoms only. Only psychiatric? Yes. I think it's important to try to to find out what percentage of the psychiatric stuff is uh, inflammatory in the brain versus reactive to chronic illness. If somebody has only psychiatric symptoms, then we have to presume in, in the absence of other kind of stress-induced factors that it's gonna be primarily inflammatory you know, brain disease. People uh, have this kind of, I think, inappropriate focus and think that psychiatric it's, is not neurologic and it, it's the same brain. You know, Whether somebody gets numbness in the part of the brain that controls the face and they get a numb face or numbness in part of the brain that bestows joy and people get depressed. It's just different sides of the same coin. So when I see patients and they get these reactions called Herxheimer reactions, which are exacerbations of underlying illness when we treat them with antimicrobials, it's very, very common for psychiatric symptoms to flare up during that time. And if that's not proof that there's an inflammatory situation going on in the brain, clearly we can do tests to corroborate this, you know, things like brain spec scans, which I don't actually favor because of the radiation dose. And I don't feel like I need them in my patients. I just kind of believe the patient. If they tell me that they're flared up, I don't need a brain scan to tell me that they're flared up. But there is evidence that this is a central nervous system inflammatory disease. And in many cases, there's inflammation associated with psychiatric illness. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it's, it would be very disingenuous for us to not acknowledge that we're all here today in this particular manner due to COVID-19. And uh, we're going to hear later on about some of the um, interesting parallels behind uh, between Lyme, chronic Lyme and uh, COVID-19. It's something that I'm particularly interested in in the research that I do. Uh, but we have a question from Mo who asks, uh, what are your thoughts on hypercoagulation with Lyme and COVID-19? I mean, with chronic infections in general, you can get a hypercoagulable state, any type of inflammatory condition, you know, things like cancers produce hypercoagulable states as well. But before COVID came around, I was seeing only the rare instance of people getting unexplained, you know, coagulation disorders. Uh, with COVID, it's kind of the rule, you know, so I do think that with COVID, it's far more common and it's a major cause of the pathology. Um, and it clearly needs to be addressed. There's data that showing that um, anticoagulant therapies can really help survival in patients with uh, COVID-19. So. Um, 
that I'm going to ask this question because it's from it's from James, who has participated in Lime Mind in the past, and very happy that him and the family are with us today. Uh, James asks, uh, Dr. Phillips and Dana, um, in your opinion, what is the first step to changing the paradigm of diagnosis, doctors, and mainstream hospitals? Um, uh, uh, mainstream hospitals that use to recognize Lyme and associated tick-borne infection, and how can we shift the opinion in the medical field? I think it starts with, I'm sorry, Dana, I think it starts with the training. I mean, you know, like I said, I try to always think that I'm not going to absorb things from how I'm trained, but it's kind of impossible not to. And I rem remember, I mean, there's still so much sexism going on in medicine. And I remember in med school, we had a class, a visiting professor came, and um, there was only about 30 people in the class, and he said, if a 40-year-old woman comes in with 20 symptoms, what does she have? And we all raised our hands. We're like, does she have chest pain? Did she have a fever? Did she have a change in weight? You know, like all these questions that a typical person would ask. And he's like, it doesn't matter. What does she have? She has 40, she's got a bunch of symptoms, a big list. She's 40 years old. And we were all stumped. And he goes, she's a hypochondriac. She's a 40-year-old woman. And it was a small class. And I was the only one that got up and left the class because I was so annoyed. And I remember thinking, there's like 39 people in this class that didn't leave, you know? And I know that, um, you know, med school is this hierarchical system and you have to be respectful and everything else, but I'm not that, I'm not young, but I'm not that old. And as of then, that was actually taught. And I was talking to, uh, so you, I know it's just one part of it, but how do you change the paradigm in general? I do think that it starts with the med school training when doctors have minds that are not yet ossified, you know, because as they get older, it's very, very hard to change old dog, new tricks kind of a situation. Yeah. So I'm so sorry. I, I, we're, I've been told that we're running short on time. So this last question is for Dana. Um, Caitlin says that she's ordered three books, but wants to know when they're coming out. And I'm actually wondering if you have a preview that you could maybe show us of, of what we're, what we can expect to see. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you for the question. Um, and what a coincidence. Look what I happen to have right next to me. This is the book. This is the book. We're so excited to show this to you today. Um, it's coming out February 2nd. We're really sorry for the delay. Uh, the delay was uh, in part because of the pandemic and everything was shut down, but it was uh, secondly because our publisher, uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, very generously and very wisely asked us to write a new chapter about COVID because there's so much overlap as you probably already recognized. And um, so we're adding that new chapter and this will be out in full February 2nd. So thank you so much for ordering those three copies. We really appreciate it.